You and I are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right. There's only an up or down. This is the No Doubt About It podcast. No doubt about it. And now your hosts, Christy and Mark Ronchetti. I never thought we'd get him. I know he's like, a, he, well, he, it's hard to get him. He's, yeah. he's popular. Yeah. yeah. No, this guy he's is. He's in uh, demand. Yeah, he's, like he actually worked himself into a New Mexico legend. He did. And now he's back. Yeah. I, on well, the four temporarily. Year, yeah. On the four year anniversary of his, his introduction to New Mexico, <laughs> the right. legendary Jeff Glassburner joins us. Now, for those of you who do not know Jeff, you're missing out. You are missing out. He was our campaign manager for the Senate race. And then he ended up, uh, and we'll talk about this story, uh, he ended up jumping in uh, down the home stretch of the governor's race as well. Jeff, thank you for joining us. I'm, uh, I'm glad to finally be in the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> now, Jeff is, uh, Jeff is now working. Uh, well, first of all, we'll get into what you're doing here. You're living in D.C. now, and, and we'll get into kind of what you're doing broadly here. But I, I want to kind of give people an idea of how we got to know you and, and how this whole process started. So, Talk a little bit about um, how we got introduced to each other back in, I guess it was two thousand late, late, late two thousand nineteen. Yeah, I, so going back almost four and a half years now, yeah. um, I remember the first time I talked to you, yeah. interview, and it was like October of, I want to say November of twenty nineteen. Yep. Um, you, you know, you were thinking about it. You hadn't made a decision yet, but you were kind of going through that process. And at the time, I was at the Republican National Committee. I was doing data stuff uh, across a region of states. Yeah. Um, but I always kind of had considered myself a political guy who did data, not right. like a, a data data guy. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I remember part of the interview, like I asked you the question that yeah. any self-respecting operative should ask. <laughs> Uh, you know, why are you running? And then you went on like a five minute stump speech that I was like, <laughs> oh my God, this is incredible. <laughs> like, like did, was somebody recording this? I think I, I literally said that. Um, and so I was in from that moment and yeah. it, luckily it worked out from there. And uh, I, I remember, I'll never forget uh, getting the job, flying to DC on like January 3rd. Yeah. And I believe the announcement was on like January seventh. Seventh. Yep. Yep. And I arrive in town, so I get in town the first day, and I in DC I didn't have a car. Like yeah. I had sold my car when I moved to DC. I, I walked to work, <laughs> like I did everything. Right. So I fly to DC. I fly to Albuquerque yeah. uh, early one morning, January third, New mm. Year, and which was just what I could put in two suitcases. Yeah. Get on the ground. First thing I do, I'm like, all right. I got to buy a car. I got to get car insurance. I got to lease an apartment, like turn that all around in like 12 hours and then showed up at your uh, announcement video shoot just up in the uh, foothills. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I don't know what I've got myself into, but uh, let's go. I mean, the ability to be able to go. I think you went to the uh, I think you went to Hertz. Right, you got it from like it was like an old Hertz rent a car. Yeah, Hertz sells old rentals, and yeah. I just went there and like got a great deal on a, a car she- with some miles. Like a Chevy on it. Cruze, tiny little Chevy <laughs> Cruze. We cruised around oh New Mexico. So here's thing. the thing about that car. So <laughs> that car. So Jeff drives this thing all all over the state. Well, we I don't know how many tires you blew on that oh, car during that million. campaign. It was unbelievable. Well, I mean. I think it was it was at least seven. It might have been eight times. Yeah. And like I was by the time that the Senate race was over, I was done. I mean, yeah. I was I was like, you're just going to leave the cruise. I was by like, the side I was of the like road. this. Yeah. Ridiculous. But and we'll get to this. New Mexico roads are still cursed for me because uh, fast forward <laughs> to, you know, 2022 in August. Yeah. Literally, I'm driving over from Phoenix to join the campaign, yeah. uh, you know, in, in August. And I get to Gallup. And I'm driving. I'm kind of caravanning with one of one of our uh, other staffers who came with me. Yep. And get to Gallup. What happens? I have a flat. But we're literally as we cross the border from <laughs> yeah. Phoenix into New Mexico. Yeah. And I was like, "You have got to be kidding uh, me!" Like I mean, what? <laughs> and, and during that Senate race, we, it, it was so. You know, you had so many flat tires. We eventually were like a pit crew. It was like. <laughs> Yeah, you two are constantly changing <laughs> it was the tire. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, by the time it was done, they get the cruise going. Like we we knew that cruise inside out. And then eventually, didn't you go bottom it out somewhere on some dirt road? Oh my out gosh! By- yeah, I mean, 
we were talking beforehand about the stories that would just come up as we talk. And he, yeah, here's one. So I've already blown out like six tires. <laughs> This is the middle of COVID, yeah. and like New Mexico was n- number one in the country for being ridiculously locked down. Right. So like we're dealing with running the campaign and all that, but like also meant there was limitations to what we could do on days because especially in the state, it's not like we were having massive door knocks or right. doing the typical campaign event uh, circuit and everything, yeah. or even fundraisers. So there's a time in the summer and the the height of the lockdowns, take the car out to. Uh, out by grants. Yeah. Um, El Malpa- was it El Mont Yes. Yeah, yeah. The volcanic rock. Yep. Uh, yep. State park. Yeah. Beautiful place. Highly recommend. For yeah. Anybody, you should spend a day out there. But I take this little Chevy Cruze, me, me and a buddy of mine who is in town, um, take the Chevy Cruze and we're kind of driving around and just seeing all the sights and hiking through the, tu- the lava tunnels and everything. And it was beautiful. And then like, we're just on these dirt roads that I really had no business taking this tiny little yeah. car on. Um, <laughs> Just ran. We're we're almost out. Like we're at the point in the in the getting out of this really rural area. It's not even. It's all gravel, dirt, dirt roads. Not even gravel roads. Just dirt like paths. Right. Like we're literally swerving through cows. Like there's oh. cows just laying on the dirt. Oh, like yeah. it was crazy. Yeah. And we're about a mile away on this like ten mile trip to get back to like a state highway, and did not see it. There was a massive rock. So we're driving. Didn't hit on the front of the bumper. Like, I I was like, oh, I'll clear this. But we were going uphill, so the rock, as we went uphill, um, hit the oil pan. So I started leaking oil, but I didn't know it happened right away. Because, like, it was just, it just felt like a bump, like all this other rocks that we're driving over. So we make it, like, another mile. Like, we're, we're, we can see the state highway. And, like, we're parked... but the car slowly starts slowing down. The <laughs> oil is burning. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, crap. Like, this is about to be a massive problem. Yep. Um, and, yeah, and so we, uh, we we got stuck there, and we didn't have cell service. We had to walk, like, half a mile in this field of cows, yeah. like, towards this state highway, praying that one of us would get a bar of service. Luckily, we did. Uh, tow truck came, like, an hour and a half later, towed us all the way back. Luckily, my tr- I AAA and the 60 mile radius or whatever was right on the edge out by Unser. Right. And so we got to like the one place that was within my like non overage limit. Right. Uh, and yeah, so that was, that was the day. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, I swear it's bad luck. Like whatever it is with the campaign and cars, like it's just, well, I, he, yeah. he comes out, I remember him coming out and, and, you t- when coming out for the governor's race and that whole thing near Gallup. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we should get all the people on the campaign team that fix the flat stuff. Remember, I want to do like welcome baskets <laughs> for really everybody. That really doesn't work very well. Oh, I know, but still, I was like, this is so bad. It's already happening. Um, and then I think you guys are working for maybe 30 days, maybe two weeks together again. And I get a phone call from you guys. And you're like, yeah, so you're not going to believe this, but... Uh, oh, yeah. oh. Do, we, do co- we have to talk about yes, this one? This is embarrassing do. for Jeff. I don't I know if we was, need to. It was the rental car, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah. So we were in a rental car. We are down in Socorro. Um, we did a fundraiser I wanna, down in I just want to I I make a point <laughs> oh, yeah. that Mark agreed with me that the setup of the dash on this car was ridiculous. It was a Volvo. And yeah. it, it, was, it was ridiculous. And <laughs> so everything that you're about to hear, it was a mistake any other person could have oh, made. Okay, all right. Any other person, person uh, could have made. But I had had the car weeks before that and had not made that mistake. But <laughs> um, so we were coming back up from, from Socorro. And all of a sudden, we're on the last hill getting into the Albuquerque area. And all of a sudden... The, the power sh- starts to shut. I mean, you're just going, you're looking around and you're, there's no juice left in the car. And Jeff's like, uh oh, uh oh. So we thought we had like a major engine problem. So we pull off to the right side of the road and figure out this is a problem that I think from the beginning of time, it, when this happens to you, you feel like an idiot because we ran out of gas. <laughs> and so it's just. And you like, called me and I said, you guys need to do a run Ketty on the road because oh, we were getting yeah. those all the time. Oh. And you both said. It was a said, rough moment for me. It was a, it was a rough one. What are we going to do? We're in the middle of the highway. We're going to do a run Ketty on the uh, road with us running. And it's, like, you know, it's not like we were in the middle of nowhere. We were. No, we, no, were, we weren't. We were we by weren't. Isleta. I yeah, think. we went to the Maverick, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We were yeah. in the Albuquerque it was metro. Just, it is just the like juju of the campaign plus a car. Yeah, I promise. Well, you I- spend so much time on the road. You're, you're literally putting thousands upon thousands of miles on your cars. Yep. And I mean, and- I blew the whatever in that rental car too. I blew something. In a yeah, rental we car had a big event in uh, right Roswell. before the yeah, right at the end, right yeah. at the very end on the end. Ketty on the road tour. Yeah, yes. I, I was just with the girls. And yeah, I we don't had know what happened. Christy, uh, it was a rental car that was a. Uh, 
It was no, like it was a, the Tahoe. It was no. a Tahoe. The Tahoe, and we had to we had to run somebody up yeah. there in a rental to no, go. No, but get it that. wasn't. But it wasn't, wasn't the, mine. No, it, it was, was a, just yeah. uh, it was a rental. But yeah. I don't know what happened to that either. I still don't know what I, if I blew the transmission or what. But that yeah, thing. I know that thing shut oh down. Oh my so, gosh! Yeah, and, that, wow. and I was in the middle of no man's land. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, no. okay. So okay. enough car stories. But, yes. Uh, yeah. We knocked some car stories out. But so so let's talk a little bit about first of all. I think I'm trying to think of the right direction to go with this, but I think just kind of. I, I'd like to hit on before we get to doing a bunch of campaign stories. I think it'd be good to kind of reset where we are because you had a very interesting job this past six to eight months. Yes. And I want to talk to you about that because it is such a it's kind of in the middle of the news. You were the Iowa state director for Tim Scott's campaign for president. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I want to I want to start there just because we're you know, it's kind of front of mind and, and we're looking at now is the race over and everything else. And, and we've talked about that. We'll talk about it again. And we'll fight about it again here in a second. But I think, first of all, your impressions, having been on the ground in Iowa, you yeah. were there throughout most of it. And, and are you surprised at where we are? Are you, you know, wh where are your thoughts on this race and what you saw in Iowa? Yeah. I mean, so first it was just an incredible experience. I mean, um, Senator Scott was an incredible candidate to work for. Um, he was the, the perfect Iowa caucus candidate. I mean, he walked into a room and he would light everybody up. Like it was uh, every single person in the room when they left, if they didn't know anything about him or they didn't have a good opinion or they didn't have an opinion of him or they weren't voting for him, they left as either a supporter of the campaign, you know, signing up to volunteer um, or just liking him as they were kind of making their decisions about who they'd caucus for. Um, so that part of it was incredible. And, and the other thing is Iowa that's so different from everything else in politics um, is – Every day, Iowans take this responsibility very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one of the coolest things is when you're doing events, you know, in the middle of the summer, like even we, you know, we were starting doing stuff in May, he announced. And our, our first event um, as an official campaign after the exploratory ended was in Sioux City. Um, he did the announcement in Charleston and he flies to Sioux City. And so we did we did a couple like press events and everything. Um, and I remember we showed up, uh, we th this amazing kind of warehouse and this local business um, that we got to do this town hall at. And it was 250 people showed up. I mean, 250 people big, on a, a big on a yep. Wednesday night in yep. Sioux City, Iowa. Um, they take it very seriously, and, and that was what the whole experience was like. And obviously, you know, you go to more rural areas, and um, the events are smaller, but proportionally for the population, like there's a lot of buy-in, and the Iowans take it very, very seriously. Yeah. Um, and so that part of it was incredible. You know, I think as we were going through it, and you're seeing some of this, some of these issues with some of the other candidates, right? Like. Senator Scott would speak for 10, 15 minutes on his quick stump, and he would take questions for 45. Uh -huh. I mean, nobody else would do that. And he would just go around the room. I mean, he would just point at him. There wasn't like a microphone Which, or anything. By the way, in a campaign like that, it's perilous, right? Because when you guys do that, you know, it's one of those things that if you don't have a great deal of confidence in your candidate, you don't always want them opening up the floor to see, because there are all kinds of people. And we've talked about that little video with this guy who hands DeSantis a precipitation or participation trophy, you know, just kind of the stupid stuff that right. can throw your campaign off. So it's not a, a given that, that a candidate sits down and takes 40 minutes of questions. No, in fact, especially in this day and age where, you know, even when you're in rural Iowa, you've got seven members of the national media from every major broadcast channel, from uh, every major online kind of news newspaper, every major publication. They're at every event. So, you know, sometimes like you're in a town of 30 people and you have 10 voters and like there's 15 members of the press there. Yeah. So wow. everything you say is immediately streamed online. And if you make a mistake once, like it can end your campaign. And I think we saw a lot this cycle with other candidates. You know, they were making news in bad ways. Um, and with Senator Scott, like that wasn't something. You know, you always worry about it. You know, when you're when you're working on the campaign. But oh. he was great, and, and he was so good at that and interacting with the voters. And um, it was it was a great experience. And I, I'm glad that I got to work for a candidate who really embraced what I was about. Yeah, he seemed. He from what we saw, he seems like such a great guy and very yeah. easy to like. Do you, I mean, I'm just curious, do you think he's going to work in some sort of like, do you think he'll keep going in politics beyond what he's doing now? Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, he's, he's still young. He's got, he's got a great future and, you know, I'd love some time to, to get to work for him again. I mean, yeah. he's a, he's a great candidate to work for. Um, and so it was a, it was a great experience. And so what happened as you do the postmortem, oh, two things, number one, let's just talk one more thing about the candidates and trusting the candidate to yeah. go out and, and and fight for themselves, basically. Right. I think it was one of the biggest mistakes that DeSantis's people made, 
thinking that and pulling him back from media, especially early on after his announcement, one of the best things about DeSantis is when he fights with the media. So to me, pulling him out of that and just having him around friendly media was a mistake. Do, can you speak to the fact that is someone who who tries to shepherd a candidate through that sometimes and 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 you may or not you may disagree, but but sometimes there's too much in the way of reins on a candidate when you got to let them go out there and swing because it's what they're best at. I, I just look back at DeSantis and think, had they let DeSantis go out there and fight it out on MSNBC and CNN, it would have helped them immeasurably. Sure, I think you know it's also very easy to Monday morning quarterback everything, right. and I think the elephant in the room was. President Trump is, you know, he was always the favorite and he's extremely, he's extremely strong. And, uh, you know, the Republican Party is, you know, huge proportions are, are 100 percent behind him. And so I think it's really easy to Monday morning quarterback that stuff. But I know just this week or last week, it might have been when Governor DeSantis, you know, he, he even mentioned himself that I think he had w- wished he had done more um more of the more of the media. I think that's exactly what he said. So, you know, I think no, nobody speaks to that better than the man himself. And, you know, he said he had wished he had done that. And um, I think there's a lot of value. And obviously, you know, on a presidential campaign, having as much exposure as possible, it's, just, you know, a, it's a national campaign. Um, any any kind of coverage you can get is great. You, so, so what happened? Yeah, what I was happened say, did you to have Tim a, Scott? Did yeah. you have a feeling it was going to end for him soon? Or was it kind of a surprise when yeah. he just like, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I'll just take the words right from Senator Scott uh, when he dropped out um, the night he dropped out on on uh, former Congressman Gowdy's show on Fox. Um, you know, the voters were saying not now. Um, they weren't saying not never. Um, and I think, you know, there was a lot of – I think one thing that's clear after the campaign is there's no other candidate um, probably besides President Trump himself who among the Republican Party – Um, did more for their favorability and their standing. I mean, you just look at any public polling. um, He's probably one of the few presidential candidates to leave in a better place than where he started um, in terms of that. So which is rare. And so I think he deserves a lot of credit. You know, he just felt that at that time, you know, he maybe the pathway wasn't there anymore. Um, But I think it's important, you know, the voters said not now, this wasn't the year, Um, but we'll see, you know, what the future holds for him. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Let's talk vice president then. Would you be shocked if he was on the short list? Uh, A lot of people have talked about it. Do you think he would like it? Do you think they should consider him? What what do you think? Yeah, I mean, he's he he would be great for the country. Um, But, you know, I I have no idea what he wants to do. And, um, you know, I don't want to pretend to speak for information I don't have. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, But no, I think, you know, he's been a great servant to this country in South Carolina as a senator. Um, And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other great opportunities he has in his future and you know, so we'll Were you surprised at all that you that he backed Trump instead of Haley for the home state of South Carolina coming up? Um, I just think it's kind of just recognition of where the you know it, it's at. At, post Iowa, um, you know, President Trump won by thirty points, and um, Governor DeSantis, you know, got out a, a couple of days later, and yeah. um, I think you know, obviously, the senator and President Trump have a great relationship, um, and just where with the primary electorate is at across the country and kind of where we're at as we look, stare down a general election against Joe Biden um, in November. Um, You know, it's just a question of kind of timing. And, you know, President Trump pulled in over 50% in the first two states. You know, so we'll see what happens from here on out. So where do you think we're going with this? Is, 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 so Haley, I mean, so we had a big argument on this on our last episode. I said, look, Haley's done. Like, it's just, there's no way to, to keep going, you know, there's no plausible case for her to make, especially going into South Carolina that's far more conservative than what New Hampshire is. So is she really going to stick around? What do you see if you looked out in a crystal ball and I told you, hey, tell me what you think probably is going to happen Well, and here. let's also back it up by saying your whole thing was yeah. she's out of money. She's going to be done with money. She's not going to be able to stay the, ne- the next month. My right. argument was there's still enough people that like her and that still want to support her. I bet some money will start flooding in for her. Right. And, you know, so, I mean, I don't know if there's truth in that. I have no inside knowledge on that either. But that was the argument we were having. Well, is, can that, she stay alive through South Carolina? Which there's going to be tremendous pressure to bail, right, from all different sorts of angles. There's also going to be the, the biggest issue, I think, is money. But then even behind money is do you want to stick your head in a wood chipper? coming up in South Carolina and, and really basically finish yourself off politically. Yeah. I mean, I think we've seen, I mean, Iowa and New Hampshire and maybe more so Iowa showed, you know, president Trump is still extremely strong with, you know, the Republican base. 
Um, and you just look at polling in South Carolina and it suggests the same. Um, you know, I think everybody has a right to do what they want and it, it continue on if, if you wish. But I think, you know, you, we can look at the first two results and make some informed guesses at, at where this thing is going to be in about four weeks or less, less than that. So do you think she'll drop out? I mean, what's your gut? What do you think? Is she done? Or do you I, think she'll I, show up in South Carolina? That was kind of our, we bet a steak dinner on it. So it's, yeah. it's I said really, she's out oh, before South I, Carolina. Then I can't get in the middle of that. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not, I'm not prognosticating on the outcome of this. Uh, but. He likes us equally, Mark. So oh, is that like, what don't it is? ask him to pick your side. Unbelievable. I, I, I can't pick sides here. I can't pick sides. <laughs> okay. And so in the, we'll just wrap up the presidential stuff here. The race versus Biden, assuming it is Trump versus Biden. Uh, partly what you're going to do coming up here in your career, you're going to be involved in a variety of different things, but one of them is polling and things of that nature, which yep. we'll talk to you about. When you look at President Trump versus Biden now, uh, it, is it the same race that it was in 2020? Is it a different race that you could draw from from years past to say, hey, if you're looking for in weather, you always do these things where you look for analog years. Right. When you try to take the atmospheric setup and match it to another year. Right. Right. Is there an analog year for 2024? Um, you know, I think it looks kind of very similar to President Trump's first run, um, more so than the reelection in 2020, just because President Trump isn't president. And, um, you know, at the time in 2016, we were coming off eight years of Barack Obama, and there was a lot of uneasiness and unrest at that. Um, and kind of where we were as a country and, and President Trump came in and, and, and obviously had his win. Um, and I think this looks a lot like that. You know, we have uh, a current Ironically, Barack Obama's vice president as president. Mm -hmm. um, you know, President Trump isn't president now. Um, and so he's getting to be that challenger role that he was in 2016. And I think, you know, as we get further into this year, um, you know, we'll see what happens with the economy and everything. But one thing that I don't think will change is, you know, it, the inflation rate is still positive. Right. <laughs> it doesn't, right. uh, prices don't go back down. Right. And so even though we're all happy that the, the rate is lower than it used to be, that's, still a positive growth in price and, and what I think everyday Americans are dealing with at the grocery store, um, even at the gas pump um, and all these different places. And so that's tough to run away from, I think, um, you know, if you're President Biden, voters haven't had a chance to punish him for the state of the economy and the state of prices and inflation, which make this a lot different than even previous recessions, I think, where, you know, it maybe took six or some months for there to be voters to start to realize the economy was better and jobs were back. That's really not the problem this time. It, the problem was inflation and, and things are a lot more expensive. Yeah. And that, because that doesn't go away, I, I don't think that problem's going to go away for President Biden either. Well, and especially not to mention the border issue. I mean, I think, you know, if he doesn't have any sort of come to Jesus on the border with solutions or, you know, anything to, to put forth on that, I think that's the thing he's going to get, you know, hung out to dry on. To some degree, but he's trying now. Oh, so I know he's, he's trying, well, trying now, They're trying to reach a deal. Well, I mean, and I, but I, I think, you know, you look just this yesterday. I think Governor Abbott deserves a lot of credit for what he's doing. Right. I mean, like, you know, and obviously the Democrats are trying to spin this one way, but, you know, Governor Abbott's putting his foot in the sand and saying, you know, we're going to, you're not going to let Texas be overrun. Um, this is a real problem. And as we're seeing in cities like New York, uh, Chicago and some of these Democratic oh. metros. Um, you know, I'm not sure if there's been a more effective uh, oh, policy yeah. in the last decade almost yeah. than Governor Abbott starting to, you know, Ship um, send illegal immigrants on buses to these places. Yeah. Um, because now, I mean, it makes sense as you look at it in hindsight, you know, when you send a lot more people to a place, it strains the resources of that place. And it, people have to, the voters in those cities have to deal with it on a daily basis, just yeah. like the people in border towns in Texas, New Mexico and Arizona have to. Well, I mean, think about the issue too. And we talked about this before that because Biden has been so irresponsible on this issue, he's moved the country right on it. Right. Right. So in other words, would we have ever talked like in the Senate race, we never would have stood up and said, we're going to put them on buses and we're shipping them out. Right. I mean, times, now, of, times have changed. Everybody, for sure. Yes. And right. that's, that, that is owed to Joe Biden really and what he's done. And the other thing that's interesting about this race is, and, and I'd love your take on this, you, you actually have a president that is, is running against a former president who can point to a short time earlier, things being this much better when the other guy was in office. Right. That's a weapon that has not been utilized before. And, and again, I think part of this becomes how little he really needs to make up voter wise. Right? right. So go through some of those numbers. People don't always realize they think, Oh my gosh, Biden, you know, he's got to make up 4 million votes. No, he doesn't. Not even close. Right. Well, I mean, every, I feel like every presidential we go through this, right. People forget it's not the popular vote. It's yeah. about what happens in a few States. And even in, you know, in 2020, 
regardless of what the popular vote was, the election came down to, you know, 50,000 votes across yeah. three states. Um, it was incredibly close. And I think a lot of people have forgotten about that. Um, and so as we look at this year, you know, especially with President Trump, if, you know, assuming he's the nominee yeah. here um, as the challenger, um, you go to a state like Arizona, where just in the midterm um, at the congressional level, it was R plus 12. Yeah. Um, there were, you know, some statewide that were R plus 12. You know, 2020, I think partisanship was uh, R plus four in terms of the turnout. And President Trump lost the state, you know, by a raise or raise within margin. As a challenger, he probably wins the state this time. Yeah. That's not to say it's not an uphill battle by any means. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be fought pretty closely. Um, but I think that just the environment is, is better this time around for Republicans in general than it was last time. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see. We'll see how that shakes out. I mean, the only thing, too, is I, I, I've been hearing a lot. We've talked about it briefly, but just the amount of potential chaos it could be on Election Day and the day after, depending on if it is a Biden-Trump election and how that shakes out, you know, is it going to create chaos regardless of the shakeout, like how it turns out. Like I, I'm a little nervous about that. And I have people that are writing in and saying, we should be praying for our country and praying that everybody keeps their wits about them and remembers what this is about. And, you know, don't make this such a divisive war, which I just don't think that people are going to change that fast because it's still the same guys. So that's why I do think in some ways it's a repeat of 2020 because it's just this well, do you think uh, turnout? Let's talk about that. You talk about the same guys, and, there, and there's and Haley's trying to make the case now, and she said it in her in her I guess concession speech in New Hampshire. Although it tried to make it sound a little bit like a victory speech, which is the the first party to get rid of their 80 year old standard bearer is going to be the party that's going to win. It, do you get the impression we're going to look at a turnout that's that's not going to be what it's been in past years because of enthusiasm? Yeah, I mean, I think when you just look at even the rate of turnout. I mean, 2020 was right record raw turnout, but the percentages historically weren't crazy. Like it, it, when you look at the percentage of like the American population, it wasn't, we weren't setting records in 2020 on that either. So, um, you know, I think it's going to be a very long year and it's about to be the longest general election of maybe American history where yeah. both parties already have their nominees lined up. Um, and so who knows the effect that that's going to have? Is that going to energize people to show up? Is it going to you know, is it going to scare people away from showing up? Um, you know, I think we're still so early in the process. And, you know, obviously the we, South Carolina is still coming up on the Republican side. So we still have some inner party stuff that we're working out. Um, so it's, it's going to be really interesting how that happens. But, you know, looking back, 2016 wasn't that high of turnout. 2020 raw turnout was was super high. But historically, it wasn't it, it wasn't like the best, the highest ever or anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so let's. Uh, I want to. I want to get into you coming to New Mexico, and and I think, um, you know, just because I I tend to do these things in the worst order possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, Some things never change. So yeah. It's, oh it's, no, no, no. There's no doubt. Brain works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. Uh, it's just jumbled in there, and <laughs> yeah. it all eventually gets out, but yeah. but not in the order it should. Um, let's. I want to talk to you a little bit about before we. Uh, you know, we can reach back to the Senate race, but the governor's race was interesting for us, and and because. You actually, so we we had made a decision to run for governor in this by the summer of 2021. We had made no decision yeah. um, at all, and so I remember you and I got on the phone, and, and you had an opportunity to be part of a campaign, the the governor's campaign in Arizona, and uh, you were we were talking about you taking a job with Karen Taylor Robeson, yep, who was a very good candidate there. Yep, she's the one who went up against Carrie Lake, and in that race, it was. Very close. And so you yeah. you hop on that campaign while we hadn't come close to making a decision. So you're doing that. And, and so talk to me a little bit about that experience. Now, And we're sitting here kind of watching you from the side going, what's because that was the biggest race in the country, really. So yeah. you're running her campaign. How intense was that? Yeah. And then we'll eventually get to what happened during, in that race. But talk about the, the intensity of that, because wherever Carrie Lake seems to go, intensity seems to follow. And this was no different. Yeah, I mean, it was I mean, it was definitely probably the craziest uh, campaign experience I've had in my life. I, I don't think there's any question. And um, funny enough, you know, most as most political operatives know, uh, you know, you don't have jobs for very long in a two year cycle, mm-hmm. uh, especially when campaigns hire. So that was 
the longest job that I've had. That, that was a long campaign <laughs> since for I left, you. It's Honestly. crazy. Since I left college, yeah. I, I was yeah. there. I was there for like fifteen months, I think, fourteen wow. months. Oh, it's crazy. Like, long. And their their so, primaries in August. Right? Yeah. So Arizona yeah. has a super late primary. So this yeah. was this was a long run. Um, and twenty twenty two, I think, as a lot of people know. Um, you know, there was a lot of really intense primaries all across the country. Yep. Um, and so we were getting started really early um, in, the, in the summer of 21, kind of getting prepared for everything. Um, and at the time, you know, the race was really, even from the start, it, there was kind of three main uh, uh, candidates. It, w- it was Karen Taylor Robeson, uh, who I worked for, right. um, Kerry Lake, and Matt Salmon, yeah. uh, former congressman. Yep. Um, he had run for governor before. He's been an institution kind of in, in Arizona politics for a long time. Um, and so, you know, in 21, it, Kerry Lake got the Trump endorsement, yeah. which obviously in Republican primaries, it's a big deal. It's, it's a big deal. And, yep. and I think most people know who Kerry Lake is now. Um, she also came with, you know, 25 years um, of camp of TV. She was on TV for 25 years. And I think as, as Mark well knows, yeah. um, it's had, quite an advantage that kind of, <laughs> you know, that kind of name ID in, in the, yeah. fe- in the Phoenix media market, which it's is the, one of the most expensive in the country. Yep. You know, if you put a price tag on it, like you're talking uh, hundreds of millions of dollars over mm-hmm. 25 years, like just in terms of raw name ID. I yep. mean, um, people, and, and you know, she was people's news anchor. They liked her. Like yeah. you, mm-hmm. you like your news anchors because um, if you don't, they don't last very long at those jobs. Right. But you would think because of that, you guys are going to get plastered in a, in a primary and get smoked. That isn't how it went down. I mean, this thing was back and forth the whole summer. Yeah. So Karen, I mean, all the credit goes to Karen. I mean, Karen was a phenomenal candidate um, and, and it was an honor to work for her. Yeah. I love her. And, you know, I would I would do anything to help her at any point. Um and we built we built a really good campaign, um, and she was you know she got really good as we got through at being a candidate, like going to the events, like getting people to buy in. She you know we raised the most money. Um, you know she she worked you know that's an important metric for candidates. Yeah, it is and, it matters. And and obviously she had a lot of money that she put into the campaign herself. But even in addition to that, we still were raising the most each each quarter. Um, and so those things, I mean those are just the kind of the blocking and tackling of running the campaign. And right. we just ran a very disciplined, um, you know, kind of focusing on the basics, fo- focusing on what we knew we needed to do in Arizona, um, you know, focusing on uh, voters I- in Arizona, you know, a lot of retirement communities and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And the main voting block for ever in Arizona has been kind of 65 and over 55 and over. And so we were doing a lot of targeted outreach to them. Um, we had an expansive field program. We had a big staff, um, we were doing all of these things, uh, kind of that you need to be successful. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we came up like four points, four yeah. and a half points short. Yeah, it was close. Um, it was really close. Um, how but, nasty did it get? I mean, it, it, it definitely got very personal at times. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it, maybe not so much from our side. We took a lot more incoming on the personal, right. um, you know, the heat of campaigns, it, it, that kind of stuff happens, uh, and I think it probably got a little bit. Uh, it, it got too extreme. Yeah. Um, and but at the time, you know, temperatures nationally were very high. You know, we're getting into like we're looking at a red wa- potential red wave happening. Right. Like we're thinking all these things are getting decided in primaries, and so, um, you know, it was it was a very it was super intense. And as we got into that last month, that final sprint was was crazy, especially in Arizona where. Um, early voting is huge there. I mean, you're looking at 70, 75% of the electorate early voting, voting by mail. And so you're chasing ballots 28 days out. Yeah. I mean, when, when those yeah. ballots go out, you're, you're trying to get your votes in. Yeah. Um, and I think we ran, you know, we ran a really good, um, absentee ballot program. Uh, we won, we won those voters by about 11 points. So, um, so let me ask you this though, I and mean, you're in the middle of this race and, and, it, and it's interesting because <laughs> different races, unfold different ways. Was it the belief in your campaign that if you could beat Carrie Lake, you had the next governor, like it was done. Like in our race, we, we knew that we were, we were very well positioned to win the primary in a big way. And then we knew, okay, now the real work begins, right? right? Were you the reverse? Were you thinking, man, we've got the 10,000 pound grill in the primary. If we're able to beat Carrie Lake, we're going to smoke, you know, Katie Hobbs. Yeah. I mean, I think you just look at the down ballot results in Arizona and you look at who Karen Taylor Robeson is Yeah, and yeah, you know, getting out of that primary for us, um, obviously you always take every election extremely seriously and diligently, and we would not have overlooked Katie Hobbs. She's the current governor. Um, 
But would we have won? Yeah, we would have won. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it sure seems that way. Are we going to yeah. tell some honesty here, or are you going to just smooth oh about over? this? Okay, so okay, so here's I think the it's thing. time for confession. Okay, so yeah, there's a bit of a confessional now. We'll go into church and <laughs> and uh, and have. You need uh, to ask for forgiveness from Jeff. I do, one. I do. I need to just do a quick uh, <laughs> quick thing before uh, before the padre. Uh, a couple. So we're watching all this at the time. So as as we're going through, so we don't for a variety of circumstances, we get into the race and and. We start going, and, and things are going well for all the big metrics in our race are going well through through the um, through January and February. Although we get to the convention, as you know, and I I talked to you during that period of time. Turns out we got smoked at the convention. What a shocker! Uh, the Republican convention that is, which just basically determines ballot order, really, all things considered. Uh, so we knew that wasn't going to necessarily go well, but we felt very good about where we were. But our problem was during the primary. We, we could not find staff. So during the Senate race, Jeff did a great job of running our Senate race, had people below Jeff that did a good job. It was, it was great. But during the governor's race, we had some really good people, but it, they were not going to be the people that we needed long term. And we knew this. So as the race starts to unfold, um, uh, you know, Jay, who's, who's our campaign consultant. So, so he does ads and things like that. And I are sitting there talking and we're like, boy, we uh we're watching Jeff, and not that we wanted you to lose, okay. Jeff. But, uh, we're gonna I, need to bring just, uh, fact checker Christie <laughs> in at some point on I, this. Listen, I, here's the I thing: I think there's might be some uh, some misleading I, statements. I mean, every I, I will be honest with this: like I wanted you back too, Jeff. If all if we're all being honest, like we saw the level of work you put in. Yeah, um, you have such. I mean, I I uh, the first day I ever met you, when you walk into our our kitchen. And I'm like, okay, uh, Mark said you were coming, but I thought that was like in a couple of days. You're like, no, it's time to get started. And I was like, okay, are you all settled? Do you need any help? And you're like, oh, I got an apartment. I have a car. Everything's great. You walk out the door. I look at Mark and I go, how old is this guy? He looks like Michael <laughs> P. Keaton. Like you're super clean cut. You look about 21. I know you're way older than that, but that's what you look like. And then you worked so hard. Yeah. Like you never stopped. You were an energizer bunny. And so we had people on the governor's race that did work hard, but we didn't have kind of like the general that could really like pull it all together for us. And so we were all missing you. We really were all missing you. But we, I, we did, I had to, had to keep reminding that Jeff is out there trying to help so, another really good candidate. And I should explain the timing on how all this works. So, so, you know, we're going through our primaries in June, right? Early June. So his is two months later. Yeah. So in other words, so we, we go through and we roll through the primary and win by 40, however many points. And I was like, oh, all right, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, the people that said they hang with us through the primary, they're all gone. Yeah. Like, right. so, they like have other jobs who wins a primary by 42 points and their staff is gone. Yeah. And so then we're looking they had to- committed though to other things. Oh. And so, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, now what? Am, oh. I, am I your new campaign manager? Like, <laughs> no. And so Jay is jumping in doing stuff. Nicole, our pollsters jumping in and doing stuff. Alexis is doing about like, we have all these people filling extra roles. I mean, literally, everybody thinks these campaigns have a ton of staff on them. They and don't. And we've said that. They don't. And then they they do when you get toward the end. That's when you have a lot of people. And even then, it's not like these are huge operations. No. No. Like, no yeah, but no. you have seven, eight people that are in a big part of the core, right? Right. right. And so, so we're watching. And we get to election night in Arizona. You know, so uh, and August. And we're watching it all like it's oh like a Oh, my gosh. It's show. like, like I'm we, on the ballot yeah. in Arizona. Yeah, That's it, what I'm. Like, and, and so so what was the what was the date? It, it was like uh, August 2nd. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. So yeah. we start watching and, and Karen goes, goes up early. Karen goes up early by like 10 points. Yeah. So Jay and I are texting back and forth. It's like looking, a Cowboys football oh, game. Oh, and Jay's way. like, yeah. we're done. We're done. And, and I, we better I said, find to, be clear, to be clear, the word done is about Karen losing. Uh, yes. <laughs> it is. Well, it is. I'm awful. sorry, Karen. I know. I'm I know. I feel like a jerk here. Yeah, because Karen <laughs> like, is a good candidate. These and also two very... yahoos yes. are over here in Albuquerque. <laughs> it's terrible. Like, I'm sorry, Jeff. Oh, look, awful. Karen's up 10 at 7 p.m. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. Awesome, I know that Jeff. sounds terrible, Be Jeff. Careful I know where you get your friends. Baby. Yeah, I, I, but no, it this speaks, speaks to, of you. It, speaks, <laughs> it does speak of you, Jeff. I know. But I'm I have just to say, giving keep, you crap. But no, then you, then you, you. Well, no. So what I did confess. was, so we start seeing, um, we start seeing. I will get to that quote in a minute. <laughs> but we start seeing the numbers come down, and, and it gets tighter and tighter, and, and you start looking at these things through the night. And this is one of those races, by the way. The, the, the total numbers weren't determined for a few days. Am I right? 
Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things where we kind of hit our number with what we had to with the group, who, like early voters. We hit the minimum side of that number, so we were like, okay, like we it, it, we probably would we would have preferred fifteen or sixteen points, and it was eleven, but we had Got to it. be double digits. And so we were we were in the realm of like victory was there, and then pretty much over the course of the night, as kind of election day results started to come in. Yeah, the the race. I think you know this was a Tuesday. The race wasn't actually called until maybe Thursday, Thursday night, yeah, late yeah. Thursday night. But we knew by the time, like, uh, you know, the, we, we were obviously going to let all the votes be counted. That's important, yeah. and I think we let that process play out, and we yeah. conceded, and and Karen put out, you know, a nice supportive um, statement, statement yeah. for Kerry. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we were going to let the votes be counted, but we 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 knew where it was headed by the time of 2 a.m. on election day. Yeah, so yeah. I remember texting with you late, late that night, and you're like, and you weren't saying anything declarative, but you're like, I'm concerned. You know, you're... You yeah, know. It, it, yeah. I think I think Kerry took a lead, like, at 1 a.m., yeah. and just with what was left and what the what the votes that had been counted looked like, like, you could project out that, like, these were probably going to be more Kerry favorable the more votes that were counted. Right, yeah. and so, and it was, I guess you could draw the comparison, like, it was basically, like, I watched you and Karen break up and I'm like, Oh, Jeff, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, so, and then I, and I called you. And he's grieving Jay. the relationship, I know, by I know. the way. The relationship was over yeah. and, and, you know, and I know it hurts. And so then I called Jay and Jay's comment was, well, how long are we going to let the body cool before we call Jeff and see if he'll come back? <laughs> and, so, and I want to be clear. Like I fully expected this to happen. <laughs> so like, Cause you I, know, these guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I think you thought you guys were going to win clearly. And then when it didn't happen, we, we did give you, you went for a couple days. You did a little Aaron Rogers darkness retreat. Yeah. 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 Am I, I right? I, you go uh, to the mountains. I, we I didn't, went, we I went didn't up to a cabin. You. I went up to the cabin in the mountains. Yep. I bought a lot of steaks. Yep. I uh, had some wine. Yep. I read some books. Yeah. It, it was a phenomenal time. I had, I had a lot of double stuff oreos i was yeah. just picking out it was it, it, it was nice um just literally by myself for like two days and I, I knew before i went up there that i was gonna do it yeah um and then kind of the i think i was there three days and the last day i was there i like started organizing yeah um the call the, started the, coming the, in from jay and mark I, I, I started organizing what it was gonna look like in the caravan of people i was gonna bring well it was which you did because you brought an amazing team no, like and, i love the people you brought like i yeah. want to point out too um you know it, uh, there was also the important factor of like one of the key members of the team who made everything happen in New Mexico was my girlfriend Lily. And yes. right. she was with us. Yeah. yeah already. And, and yep. Lily, I, I think between Ella's screaming for her right behind you right now because Ella's a big, big Lily fan. Yes. So the, as we know, I, so. I know that the girls love the Lily. Girls and love Lily, Lily. Lily loves the girls. I love Lily. Yes. <laughs> She's my favorite person yes. ever. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Definitely, definitely my better half. Yeah. Um, but so she, I know Lily had been here with Jessica and Alexis kind of. Yeah. Just holding the shit like down. Being I mean, three cooperative campaign managers at the same time, yeah. holding it together. Great. She yeah. was great. And mm -hmm. so, like, Lily was here in Albuquerque, and I was in Phoenix and yeah. doing the long distance thing. So, in addition to coming to back work for you, like, I was also like, I want to live in the same city as my girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I couldn't not do that. Like, yeah. And it, and it changed the trajectory of everything for the campaign because you brought a communications person, you brought a field person, right. you brought everybody from Karen's campaign. They just all kind of slid. We over. had a nice little campaign in a box. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it was, was yeah. perfect. I mean, um, well, we had, I'll remember the day that he said, okay, Jeff's coming. And we were like, yeah. Like everybody was so excited, Jeff. So I am sorry for Karen, and I'm yep. sure good things will still happen to her because she's a good person. But we needed you. Well, I'm it so was glad you showed up. It was great, and um, I was uh, maybe my favorite thing um, outside of working for Karen on that campaign was we had an incredible staff mm -hmm. um, yeah. from top to bottom. I mean, our staff by the end was probably 20, 25 people. Um, we had amazing field reps, and like they're all going on to do big and better things. I'm sure they'll all be much more successful than I will. So we, I was very lucky in a time where it was hard to hire campaign staff. We kind of put together a great group of kids. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to, to bring some of them mm -hmm. and some of my lieutenants, uh, out with me and join forces with Lily and some of the, some of the good staff that you guys had here. And mm -hmm. we kind of, uh, merged forces and yep. sat down in the conference room. I think, you know, election day was August 2nd. Uh, the race was called August 4th. And I think I was here by August 10th. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That sounds about right. It was and right after the uh, DeSantis event we did. That's I right. Were, yeah. yeah. And, yep. and I, I remember me and Brandon, who's the political director on Karen, who came with me, and Ryan, who's our comms director. Um, I remember we, we got in town, and the first thing we did, you know, the, the day that my tire was flat, to be clear. So we yep. finished the drive. I get some air in my tire and make it to Albuquerque. Sit down for like six hours and just 
download everything like yep. with Alexis and Lily and Jessica um, and like just going yeah. through everything. Um, and then, yeah, it was off to the races and we just kind of, we picked up, started running 2000 miles per hour and yeah. uh, didn't look back for the 80. 80- Three day sprint that it was. Yeah. yeah, and me and you guys put together the whole RV tour that we ended up doing for the last two weeks of the campaign, going back to all thirty three counties. That was just so memorable. Like it's such a, bu- I mean, it's a bummer, obviously, how it ended for us, but but I will never regret. I just think that's one of the best memories as a crew that we all oh, had was going out there and meeting everybody. That and- will be one of my favorite. I, uh, for as long as I do this, that will be one of my absolute favorite, I think, things that I will have, you know, had yeah. a hand in putting together. I mean, yeah. um, our team did a phenomenal job. I remember and, Lily laying out the yeah, schedule the, you know, the map with Brandon, <laughs> Brandon and yeah. Lily kind of putting together the operational side of it. And yeah. then all of our field staff, Madeline and yeah. Vince and yeah. um and uh Kirk and um, uh, Adam and everybody. I yeah. mean, they, it, it was an all hands on deck effort, you know, laying out line by lines for 33 events. Yeah. Um, it was great. It was I mean, it, it was so much it was like fun. A concert. It was, <laughs> I, I know we, st- we started on like a Friday night and yeah. we went all the way through the Monday before election day. Yeah. So it was like 11 day tour. Yeah, yeah. It was long. It was long. And I mean, yeah, 30, it was so much fun. Yeah. And, and you should do that. I mean, honestly, it, it, everyone, every, and even an elected should do that. And just yeah. sit down and go to every county it's and so sit important. down with everybody. Yeah. It's the best. It's how you it really guys really see and know people. I mean, yeah. we've been to all those counties before, but not all collectively. Right, right. And I think just that that was it built a lot of momentum. It was great. We also got to celebrate Jeff's birthday like a hundred times. Yeah, we did. Uh, well, we well I want to be clear. We actually celebrated Hector's birthday <laughs> know, that's yeah. true. a lot more so, than yeah, mine. Yeah, we do have so. video of that. I'll pull that out. Then oh, that was that. so. That yeah. was one of the things we do was we go to a restaurant somewhere. <laughs> And then it, it would always be a race to figure out who could tell the server it was someone else's birthday. Yeah. And, and so Hector usually took the, you know, Hector was, it was Hector's birthday. Seriously, Hector drove the, so the, it started at the a, RV for us. I think it started at the Texas Roadhouse in Hobbs. Yes, that's right. Like we bring right. a crew. Yep. So we had, we had DPS officers who were with us at the time. So right. we, we had, a, we had all of our staff, we had the bus out front, yeah. we had, we had the whole family, yeah. I think the yeah. first Security, time. Yeah. So we had like, we were rolling deep. Like we had yeah. 20 people yeah. at this Texas roadhouse yeah. and, and Hector, <laughs> or, or no, I think the first time we did it, we just pulled the prank on Hector. Yeah. Like we told the, we told the waitress offline, like, yeah. Hey, Hector's birthday. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> and, uh, Hector, you know, they bring out the sombrero for him. Yeah. It was yeah. hilarious. Yeah. It was great. Um, and then, like, the next night, so this just started to become a thing. Oh, yeah. It just became a thing. And so I forget where we were the next night, but it happened again. But then the third night of this in a row, or the second night was Roswell, actually. That's right. Because yeah. the third was- night was up up in uh, uh, Espanola. Espanola. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Where, where yep. It got, got turned you. on me. They yeah. got you. But the best story is when I turned it on Hector. Because Hector, we're sitting at this long table at... I'm gonna do some some advertising here yeah, yeah. for Drop. the best restaurant <laughs> in Roswell, uh, well. yeah. Antigua. Antigua is um, incredible. We're you doing a quick little ad there. thing here. <laughs> yeah, um, it's little your ad favorite read. restaurant. Both oh, if you've never been to Antigua and Roswell, the the, the ribeye tacos yes. are incredible, <laughs> <They> <laughs> unbelievable, are incredible. Yep. unbelievable. Yep, it's best. Um, We've been there so at, at least fifty times oh, yeah. on campaign trips. Yeah, like I kind of just want to drive down there tonight just to eat dinner. Yeah, but so we're at we're at this long table. And I'm sitting at kind of one end and Hector's at the other and we're getting near the end and the waitress comes over to me and she's like, what's your, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? And I'm like, why? Yeah. (laughs) And she goes, well, it's your birthday, isn't it? I go, oh, the guy at the end of the table, Hector, (laughs) he's the one who told you this, isn't he? And she goes, yeah, why? And I go, well. It's his birthday, and we told him all day that we were going to do this for him. So he's, this is what he's, he's clearly just trying to turn the tables because he's, he's shy and he doesn't want to be embarrassed. So without telling him, this is his favorite ice cream. You need to, do, like, you should do this for him. And she goes, she looks at me all confused for a second, like, mm-hmm. what are you guys doing? <laughs> um, but she's like, all right, fine. So she goes to the back and they start preparing all the things. And at this restaurant, they do a great. Like oh, it's birthday like, celebration. It's like fireworks. And, yeah, and oh, the yeah. waitress kind of picked up that there was like some stuff <laughs> some happening. Some chicanery going some, on. Yeah. There was some shenanigans <laughs> happening. And I'm just looking down the table this whole time at Hector. And he's got this sly uh, he look on his he face. He's, got you. he's like, he, he can't help it. Like he's trying to hide it. He's like <laughs> just smiling, like down there looking at me. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know what's about to happen. <laughs> and then so there's there's like the bar area and 
the line of waitresses, like six of them, seven of them, come out from the bar area, and they're heading straight to our table, and you can't tell which direction they're going to head. So for a second, I'm like, maybe they turn the tables back on yeah. me and come back. And they start heading for Hector. Yeah. And Hector sees it immediately. <laughs> he stands up. <laughs> And all the waitresses are clapping and everything. They're like, they're bringing this ice cream that has like a firecracker yeah. candle yeah. on it that's just shooting yeah. sparks everywhere. And Hector singing, gets up yeah. and sprints to the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. Sprints to the men's bathroom. The waitresses follow him yep. and just sing to him <laughs> yes. while he's in the bathroom by himself, like just yelling at the door. We're all losing our minds at yeah. the table. It was so fun. It was great. And I have then, video of that too. So yeah. then the final, the final piece of that story is the next night we're in Espanola. We're yeah. at, I, I forget what the restaurant was, but it was, it was delicious. Yeah, it was uh, Mexican yep. restaurant. Yep. Um, yep. And it was, it was so good. And Hector speaks to the waiter yeah. and he starts speaking in Spanish to the waiter. Well, and now you're host. I, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know Spanish. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, oh, something's something's happening. But I, I kind of forget about it because he did it at the start. Yeah. And all of a sudden, out comes out comes like the clapping, <laughs> yeah. the singing, and a, yeah. this, oh, there this you go. massive. There, oh. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Your sombrero. There Oof. it is. Oof. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I look rough too. That was, well, hey, that was day a, twelve. <laughs> that was like day twelve well, I think of that, that was tour. Like we were twenty four hours away from the election yeah. or something. I recall, that yeah. event in Espanola was huge. Yeah, yeah. Was, it was. It was huge. a great night. Yeah, it was a good. Um, night. Yeah, and then I, I had that sombrero on, just getting changed. So I, I hate to bring the bring the uh, bring the discussion down, but I think people would want to know when you, when you look back and do the the post mortem on our race, yeah. knowing that you know uh, a variety of things went down. What do you think was the reason that we didn't get to the finish line and win? Yeah, I think especially when you when you look at what the national environment was, right? And we're so we're coming into the end, and it, uh, polling was actually pretty accurate. I think there was some more partisan polls that came out near the end that kind of spun everybody up. Yeah. But for the most part, from from late July to probably um, mid October, polling had been pretty clear. Like it was going to be Republican favorably, but. F- it's going to favor Republicans was the environment, but it wasn't going to be overwhelmingly. So like we thought, and then at the end, there were some partisan polls that come out. You start looking at some of these results in states like Arizona and Pennsylvania, where there's these super close races that Republicans look like we might pick up. And for us, I think to win the national environment was good. It was going to have to be a red wave. Yeah. Um, especially post Roe versus Wade, like in what the democratic turnout was going to be. Um, we needed, it needed to be a red wave nationally. And that was going to help the, that meant the environment was good enough locally for us to get there. Um, and then, you know, you get to election night and the results start coming in on the East Coast. Um, and obviously some states like in Florida, you, you know, it was uh, overwhelming. But you look at some of the congressional races in Virginia. Yeah, it's not um, good. It, and it was clearly on – we were on shaky ground. Yeah. Um, and when the national environment was not overwhelmingly Republican, that sent off some pretty big warning signs. Yeah. Um, you know, looking back now, I think – it real twenty twenty the story of twenty twenty two was every state was different. Um and like the red wave materialized in some places with like really strong GOP governors and um, you know, really good they had really good operations in those states and everything and, and they had really active it, kind of active Republican apparatus up and down the ticket. Um here, at the end of the day, um there was no swing voters when it came down to it. Um you look at all the results up and down the ticket, there were no candidates that overperformed or underperformed. Um, we were all kind of in line with each other. Um, and at the end of the day, here in what is a D plus 13, 14 state on partisanship, Democrats Meaning showed up to vote. Meaning they're 14% more Democrats. Right. Vote than Republicans. And then – and we lose by six. Right. And so, you know, we got pretty close to hitting our numbers with independents. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when you look at the breakdowns, we definitely won them. And we won them by enough of a margin that if the red wave had been there, I think we would have won. Yeah. Um, but – this is a D plus 14 state. And if the Democrats show up to vote, it's really, really tough for a Republican to win. Um, and I think, you know, that that plays a huge role in kind of why we fell out short. And, and I do think it's important for people to know, too, especially those who, who are involved in politics in this state. You do have to get Democratic votes to win. So this yeah. thought process, if you can run a hard you know, base strategy, meaning just get those Republicans out and you're going to win. That's not how it goes. Like you've got to reach over to the other side and try to get some of those votes over. And this wasn't a story in other states, but we didn't really have a huge Republican turnout problem here. Yeah. Um, I, I remembering back to the 2020 Senate race, I remember on election day looking at some of the numbers that were coming in throughout the day of like turnout at these precincts. And we were nervous during the day that like Republicans didn't show up. Right. Um, that really wasn't the case this time, um, which was the case in some of these other states. Like we, 
we did a pretty good job of getting Republicans to show up. Right. Just turns out that there's a lot more of them than there was of and us. Do you, do you attribute that to the to the Roe versus Wade decision or the or the Dobbs decision? I the, think the, that absolutely. In in a more left leaning state with more partisans, it was a turnout machine. Yeah. Like, you know, we won independence. Um, just given the fact that you know we lost by five, I think. Um, you know, and the partisanship being D plus 14 and no, a it's half. No, it's a big, it, it's a big, it, you know, we got a lot know, of votes. Yeah. We, yeah. We, you outran partisanship by 10 points. Yeah. Um, there were other states where the GOP candidates were underrunning partisanship by five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10 points. Um, so you kind of take one of those electorates and overlay what we did. Be you know, killer. You'd yeah. be winning by 20 points. I'd be points. governor of Arizona by 17 points or whatever <laughs> right. it is, right? Like, yeah. And, and so I think. Yep. You know that's why the red wave materialized in some places, and some places it didn't. It was a it was a turnout machine for them, and in a state like this, it's you can't overcome it. Yep. I'll tell you just as the spouse, and the, a lot of people don't get to obviously see the inside of the war room, which is where you guys all go and hang out on the night of election night. I watched it in the Senate race, um, and then this was a much bigger event because we weren't all shut down by COVID um, for the governor's race. And being in that war room, and it's very tense and very quiet. You guys are you take this all very seriously. We're all watching precincts and numbers coming in. And with all the analysis that you had in the background before you even started doing campaign work, you know, like you talked about with all the data, you're really quick to know. And we have a team that does all that with you. And, you know, I leave and I come back. I'm kind of it's told to come back to the war room. And everybody's got is everybody super solemn. And I'm like, what? Like, what happened? You know? And I'm like, wait, 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 it can't be over. It can't be over. And I always look at you because I know I'm like, he knows data. And so even if it's really bad news, like I need to know. And I just looked at you and I was like, are we really done? And you said, yes. And I was heartbroken, but I, I know that you, you know, what's hard is people kept telling me afterwards, why did quote unquote Mark concede so early because it's so early in the race or whatever. Right. And they just don't understand. And I didn't either, you know, understand that like you guys get those numbers, number one, before a lot of the two TV media gets it. And so that doesn't blast out as fast. And you also know how many numbers you have to get in each area in each County. Right. And you know what the expectation is already. So right. there's a lot of science and analytics behind that. And I think, you know, the general public doesn't see that. Yeah. So, Mark wanted to let people go. They had been supporting him for however many months. And he's like, it's not fair to like drag this out when I know that I can't, I'm not going to get the votes tonight. So, yeah. And it was, it was tough. I mean, um, and this was a little bit different than 2020 in the sense of in 2020 as election, as the election results rolled in, we started in a worse place than when we finished. Right. Um, And that was just given some of the, the ways, what, counties reported first, like what were these batches of votes early in person, mail, you know, and you can, we're tracking the partisanship of these breakdowns. So we know what our performance is relative to partisanship. Right. Um, and this time was a little different. Um, the first results that came in were from some of the rural counties and we were outperforming our 2020 margins on some of these early returns in some of these counties by 10, 12, 13 points. Um, so that was like, it was great news. It looked great. Um, and then as, you know, as we start to get more and you start looking down the ballot and you start seeing that, yeah, we're outperforming by 10, 12 points in some of these counties, but everybody on our side is. And obviously, like, we want Republicans to win, and I wish all of them would have, but given the kind of environment we were in, if there was a big swing vote contingent, you would have expected us to be outperforming some of the other races on the ticket. Um, and that wasn't there. And so that was a huge alarm bell. And then, you know, the Bernalillo results start coming in and you could see immediately Democratic turnout was just, it was, it, really it, it was really, really high. Um, and we just weren't hitting numbers necessary. Um, and so it kind of just, it continued to get worse uh, as kind of the night went on. And um, it was, you know, it's incredibly sad. I, yeah, yeah bawled that night. I, yeah. And I think people don't probably realize how painful it can be after all of us. Even, I mean, you're like part of the family. So yeah. we all get incredibly close. We're all aiming towards the same goal, which is to make the state better. Yeah. And when that doesn't happen, it's like, it's, it is, it's crushing. So just word of advice for anybody that's thinking about running, like there's a lot to it that goes into it and a lot of decision-making. And so, well, it's also one of those things. Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. And, but it's one of those things you wouldn't change for the world either no. because, because right. there's nothing like getting up and taking a swing and trying to do something big. Right. And I think that's why you've been in, in campaigns the way you have. 
because there's nothing beats the energy. I yeah. mean, nothing. There's, there's nothing close. No, it no, isn't. There's you, nothing you, close. No, and you can even take athletics. Like it's not. It, it even beats that because this is so much more final. Right. There's ne- there's not another season. You know, you don't come back, you know, when you're Dak Prescott and you choke it out in the playoffs again. Right. <laughs> you know, you get to come back the next year, it turns out. Uh, in this, th- there is no more final right. thing than this. And so is that what keeps drawing you back to it? Just the that feeling that, man, there is no more intense environment than a political campaign. Yeah. I mean, I like to say it's the closest thing to professional sports that exists except instead of having lots of regular season games, you have one championship yeah. game, and or maybe two if the primary yeah. and everything, um, and that's it. And, you know, you can – when you have a lot of games in, like, sports, you can get better, you can improve, you can do this. You know, in politics, you got that general election, and you've got to throw everything you can at the wall. And, you know, we're talking about moving people, you know, depending on where you're starting from, you're moving people, you know, tens and twenties worth of points in some subgroups or overall in the electorate or, um, you know, you're doing everything you can. You're spending every dime you can raise. Like you're figuring out, all right, where are we overlooking? Where are we not looking? What is our opponent doing? Um, and every day with your, I mean, and especially for you who you had to leave your job, you know, it's, if you win, you keep your job, you've got a job, you'll find a job. If you lose, yeah, you have no job. I yeah. mean, right. it, in in the professional world, it doesn't get much more competitive than that. Right. Yeah. Keep your job or lose your job. Yeah. So it's uh, I'm a very uh, competitive person, as I know you guys are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's I'm, I guess I'm addicted to that. Which yeah. I, I don't know what that says about me. That's probably a problem. No, but. no, no, no. You're very professional. <laughs> like I think that that's you know we wanted somebody to put everything in it because we were putting everything on the line too. Yeah. So no, yeah. and so what do you see if, for you? What do you where do you go from here? Like what where, where, where do things go for for you? And and what do you see happening? Will you get involved in another campaign? Yeah. So. I mean, I love campaigns, and so I never want to not do campaigns. Right. Um, that's like really important to me. It's kind of part of who I am now, and I think I'm I think I'm decently good at them and organizing yeah, them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and especially with my data background and the way it kind of started and introed myself a little bit, I was you know I've always considered myself a political guy who either did or understands and knows data. Um, and so kind of this next part of my career, um, a it's in the last seven years. Six years, I've lived in seven states, moved, you know, rented too many U-Hauls, had too many leases. Uh, the time had come to an end. Like, I, I cannot do that again. Right. Um, and I got to scratch the presidential itch that I had with with uh, Senator Scott in Iowa, so that was great. But I, I'm not going to go on a campaign like that again. But I'm going to stay involved. Um, I, you know, I'm now uh, kind of doing polling things. I'm still doing political things um, for different entities and, and, and some people I care about and who I want to help out and just making sure that um, – you know, doing it kind of from a bigger picture level, the more strategic level, less so the day-to-day operations, more so, all right, let's look at this data. What does it mean for the decision-making on what TV ad we're going to run or what mail piece you're going to do or how you should organize your campaign or talk about this issue um, and really try to shape the direction of campaigns, less so on, you know, that we're driving to Gallup, New Mexico for <laughs> all the county GOP meeting. No, it's and true. Blowing it, a car tire <laughs> for the twenty fifth time. Well, it is true though, and, and it's something that people don't always understand from the outside. Is that you know you're not just throwing up ads here or there. You're not you're not just throwing messaging out that you hope sticks. Right. I mean, there is a lot of data that goes into these decisions. And, and so the, the thought process, I think sometimes people are like, why don't you just talk about this and you don't want, you know, or whatever. And it's right. like, the, if you're doing it right, you, you vetted all of those things. Doesn't mean you may always make the right decision. You don't always make the right decision. Right. But for the most part here, this is not something and you don't step, you know, into this and and say lose. Right. Um, because you, you have no visibility and haven't put the time and resources into it. A lot of times, and this is one thing I tell candidates who say, what's one thing you could tell a candidate? Right. And the one thing I would tell a candidate is, above all else, and this is a terrible thing to say, especially for very competitive people who are locked in and, and think they can control an outcome. Right. Odds are th- what happens to you in your campaign and whether you're successful or not will come down to something that is completely and totally out of your control. And as long as you're okay with that, hop in, the water's warm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of campaigns, I mean, campaigns are 
I mean, there's big spending that happens, right? And, and part of the reason that it's important on a data-driven campaign is you're efficient with the people who are contributing to your campaign's money, right? You don't you don't want to waste the money. You want to use it efficiently. You want to reach as many voters as possible. Nope, um, signs don't win elections, Jeff. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> signs don't win elections, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, well, yes. Um, <laughs> but you want to make sure you're doing all of those things. Um, and so, you know, as you're as you're as you're doing this, it's important that you're you're following those kind of details and making sure that the campaign is being run in a way and it, competitively that you're take you're vetting every single thing, like you said. Um, and so, you know, having that data is is important. Yep, no doubt. Well, you are forever part of our family, Jeff, as is Lily. So uh, we miss you, Lily. A little shout out for her. <laughs> Honestly. I- this feels like just like old times, like <laughs> yeah. it, like no different than uh, like four years ago or yeah. two years yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, Jeff, thanks very much. We appreciate it, and I'd love to see you here. And I'm sure you're going to be in and out of New Mexico doing some of the work you're doing, and we'll have you back on when you come back into town. Love it. All right, brother. Very good. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the No Doubt About It podcast. We hope you've enjoyed the show. We know we had a blast. Make sure to like, rate, and review. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at No Doubt About It Podcast. No Doubt About It. The No Doubt About It Podcast is a Choose Adventure Media production. See you next time on No Doubt About It. There is no doubt about it.